Dear Are colleagues, we welcome you, welcome you organized by the IPA website editorial board. Our session today is dedicated to the dialogue between psychoanalysis and neurosciences, a dialogue conceptualized and proposed by our special guest, Mark Solms. To animate this dialogue, we have also invited and have the pleasure to have with us David Tuckett for Europe and Ricardo Bernardi for Latin America. But before introducing them to you, I will give you some organizational information. As usual, the webinar will be divided in two parts. During the first slot of 45 minutes, Mark Solms will present us his statement and the perspectives he proposes for the dialogue between psychoanalysis and neurosciences. Then, David Tuckett and Ricardo Bernardi will discuss Mark Solms' proposals. It will be a question of reflecting together on the role and place of psychoanalysis in the modern arsenal of treatments. How could we potentially increase the presence of psychoanalysis in the scientific and mental health communities? During the second slot, the question and answer session, it is you attendees. You can ask your questions and our guests will answer and discuss as many as possible. Already during the presentation, you can post your question. For doing so, please post your question in the question pane at the right hand side of your screen. You have to go to the question line. There is a small white arrow that precedes the word question. Click on it to open the question dialog box, type your question and send it. During the discussion, we will try to send in your chat box the questions asked and you could read them if it is below the question box. And now, let me please introduce you our guest, Mark Solms. Professor Mark Solms is a member of the American Psychoanalytic Association, of the British Psychoanalytical Society, and training analyst of the South African Psychoanalytical Association. He is director of neuropsychology at the University of Cape Town and Crude Sewer Hospital, member of the National Academy of Science, honorary fellow of the American College of Psychiatrists, co-chair of the International Neuropsychoanalysis Society, chair of the International Psychoanalytical Association, chair of research of the International Psychoanalytic Association, Science Director of the American Psychoanalytic Association. He, is, he has authored over 300 articles and eight books. His collected papers were published in 2017 at the Feeling Brain. Mark, please. Thank you very much. Um, because I am um, allocated only 10 minutes now, I, I've written down uh, what I want to say, and I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to make 20 points. First point, mental states are not reducible to brain states or vice versa. Psychoanalysis and neuroscience provide two observational perspectives upon the same thing. Freud called this thing the mental apparatus, and he explicitly acknowledged that it can be studied from both points of view. Second point, Freud used neuroscientific findings from his own times to construct his model of the mental apparatus. Specifically, he adopted the notion that consciousness is an attribute of the cerebral cortex and is accordingly bound up with perception. It's therefore legitimate to correct Freud on that score using modern neuroscientific findings. Third point, the following two findings are most relevant in this respect. A. Consciousness arises from deep brain stem structures that perform the functions which Freud attributed to the id. The id is therefore not unconscious. B, the cortical ego is intrinsically unconscious and it derives all of its consciousness 
from the brainstem structures uh, that perform id functions. The, ig, the, the ego is therefore not the font of consciousness. Fourth point, consciousness is revealed to be a fundamentally affective function. This isn't an idiosyncratic view of my own. Uh, it's, some, it's a view that's defended by Panksepp and Damasio to mention just the two most prominent proponents. Five, if the id is conscious, it raises the obvious question, what and where in the brain is the unconscious? Six, neuroscientific research shows that unconscious or non-declarative memory systems are located primarily in subcortical basal ganglia of the forebrain. It's important to note that these memory systems generate action programs, not thoughts. Seven, my own view, which is consistent with that of Carl Friston, is that these programs take the form of predictions, that is, predictions as to what one can do to meet one's instinctual needs. The aim of all learning is to automatize such predictions. Automatization involves a memory process called consolidation. Eight, some predictions are legitimately automatized and others are illegitimately or prematurely automatized. And the second type is what we call the repressed. The repressed consists in least bad predictions that a child can muster when it's overcome by insoluble problems, that is by unmeetable instinctual needs. Nine, non-declarative memories cannot by definition be brought back to consciousness. That is, they cannot be reconsolidated in declarative memory. Repressions can therefore never be undone. 10. Our instinctual needs become conscious at their source as feelings, hence the conscious id. Legitimately automatized predictions regulate such feelings successfully. Illegitimately automatized predictions do not. That is why our patients suffer mainly from feelings. Freud conceptualized this under the heading of the return of the repressed. But the repressed itself does not return. The unregulated feelings do. 11. Secondary defenses, which are not synonymous with repression, are designed to get rid of these feelings. That's why falling ill coincides with the failure of defenses. 12. Modern neuroscientific research shows that we have far more than just two instinctual needs. 13. I believe that our clinical work is greatly enhanced if we use the unregulated feelings our patients suffer from as the starting point of our analytic work. From the feelings, we can infer which instinctual emotional needs are not being met. This in turn facilitates identification of the repressed predictions that the patient is unsuccessfully using to meet their needs. 14, the repressed predictions are inferred from the transference. Transferences, please note, are automatized action programs. They cannot be remembered, as I said before, but they are always enacted. 15. Transference interpretation unfolds over four steps. A. Can you see that you're constantly repeating this behavior? B. Can you see that it's meant to meet this need? C. Can you see that it doesn't work? And D. Can you see that's why it's suffering from this? That's why you're suffering from this feeling. 16. Transference insights enable patients to generate new and better predictions, but they cannot reconsolidate and thereby extinguish the old ones. For that reason, despite the insights they attain from transference interpretation, patients continue to enact the old action programs. Transference interpretations therefore need to be repeated over and again until patients can make them for themselves, ideally while the enactment is happening rather than afterwards. This is what we call working through. 17, it takes a long time to automatize new predictions. In cognitive neuroscience, we say that non-declarative memories are hard to learn and hard to forget. That's why psychoanalysis takes a long time and requires frequent sessions. 18, the new predictions are gradually preferred over the old ones because they work. But the old ones are never extinguished. That's why our patients can always return to their bad old ways, especially under pressure. 19, the few points I've just made 
Firstly, bring our basic theory into line with modern neuroscientific knowledge. Secondly, enable us to explain the scientific rationale of our therapy to non-analysts in a way that they can understand. And thirdly, open our theory and our therapy to ongoing scientific scrutiny and improvement. My last and 20th point is that I'm mindful of the fact that neuropsychoanalysis focuses almost exclusively on basic Freudian ideas, but we had to start somewhere. These ideas are our common ground. I'm also aware that many of the points I've made are already central tenets of some post-Freudian theories and techniques. This isn't surprising. We do what works, but now we understand better why it works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this so clear statement. Thank you very much. And now it's uh, uh, up to David. I will present you David Tackett. David Tackett, he is training analyst at the British Psychoanalytical Society. He is currently professor and director of the Center of Study of Decision Making Uncertainty at University College London. He is a senior research fellow at the Kiel Institute for the World Economy and Principal Investigation. He works part time in private psychoanalytic practice. He was president of the European Psychoanalytic Federation, editor in chief of the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, founder of the new Library of Psychoanalysis, chair of the EPF Working Party on Comparative Clinical Methods and winner of the Signory Award for his contributions to psychoanalysis. He is director of psychoanalytic electronic publishing, which won the Signory Award in 2018. And he's the author of many, many books and articles. David, please. So, uh, Mark, thank you very much for your uh, very clear exposition. Um, I don't... It, so the 20 points I, I, I think are very, very good. And I, I, think the, I think the paper is very useful. So from my point of view, I have a limited number of points which are just spontaneous responses. So the first one is that I think we, should, we need to be clear that ultimately psychoanalysis needs to rest on the observations made in the consulting room by the psychoanalyst. Uh, and what then matters is the theory we have about that. Now, I think it's extremely useful to have uh, what Mark would call an updated uh, neurological uh, or neuroscience uh, version of the way Freud was thinking. And I myself believe that it's pretty essential that we base psychoanalysis in Freud's thinking. I think as soon as we don't do that, or as soon as we want to disagree with his core propositions, we need to be very careful what, what, what we're doing. Uh, so from my, from my point of view, moving to the clinical situation, uh, as I see it, the situation that Mark is, is describing, the way the brain works, means that the central thing he's emphasizing is affect feelings. And that I think this is, this is absolutely useful to have that spelled out with a clear theoretical background. That what we're really talking about is that thoughts, whatever exactly thoughts are, because <laughs> we know what we are, they are when we're having them, but I think they're difficult to conceptualize in other ways. But what we, I think learned from neuroscience is that thoughts are always associated with affect. There are very rare occasions when that's, that's, not, that's not true. And so probably thinking itself is linked to the management of affective experience. So for me, the starting point in the clinical situation is the actual psychoanalytic setting which means Freud's idea of free association for the patient and evenly suspended attention, so-called, for the analyst. And this is, I think, where 
we create the conditions for these uh, automized reactions. I'm sorry, Mark, I may not have caught your exact phrase, to sort of come into play. So, you know, the patient is lying on the couch, they think of this, 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 and this, and if they're allowed the space, because the analyst provides the space for that to happen, they will eventually, sooner or later, come upon thoughts, we hypothesize they come upon thoughts, that create affects, that create a problem, which is what Freud called resistance. Now, generally speaking, that because that's taking place in the context of the session with the analyst, I think the the thought that the affects relate to thoughts about the analyst and the analysts, how the analyst is receiving the associations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now we have a whole set of thoughts about projection and introjection and all the rest as to how it is that a patient comes to see an analyst or indeed the other people in their life in the way they do. But those are just theories. You, projection and introjection are ultimately, I think, intellectual ways of constructing what we observe. They're fundamental, I think they're fundamental to psychoanalysis, but what we observe in the session is the effect of it. So we observe that the patient sees us as threatening or is frightened of us or thinks we are, in, for example, Dora's case, perhaps trying to seduce them or whatever it, it might be. The key point it being that the patient has ideas which produce affects, which produce problems. Now, I find it useful to think of the transference as a template built up from the first moments when experience has been registered in the brain. And I find it pretty useful if I've understood it correctly to think of the way experience is registered in the brain in the way that Mark has, has outlined. That is essentially as needs encountering situations from the very beginning, and then what Mark is calling non-declarative uh, memories, which I think is similar to, is it Klein? Whichever person it was that say, uh, memories in feelings. I mean, I think that's really what you're underlining with, with your ideas. So the, the basic point is that we think of patients as operating with an internal template, which constructs the dynamics of their relationships to their analyst, and to all the other people they meet. And our job is to identify this template. And so as I see it in the pre-association and even the suspended attention process, these templates come to the fore. And they don't come to the fore by, so to speak, the cognitive um, stories or whatever it is that the patient is saying, but by the affective situation that is, that is occurring. Now, I suppose the one of the key elements I would add to what Mark has said is that there are two people in the room and that the human um, human beings are uh, the, the whole of our biology and everything else is linked to the fact that we've we've uh, developed as social beings. So there are also things happening between people from the start. So for example, what Freud called resistance, to, which is resistance to free association, that is affect, the affects that respond to ideas. As I see it, often that resistance is more apparent in the analyst response to the free association than it is necessarily directly in, in, in the patient and indeed, one of the interesting things, I think, is that if we prematurely respond to patients before the resistance is apparent to them, we prevent them being able to see the affects that, so to speak, are disturbing them because we get disturbed first. So I hope I've said enough to give some uh, introduction to the way I would start to use uh, the way Mark is thinking. And just to summarize, I think that uh, the starting point for psychoanalysis has to be the clinical 
events in the consulting room. But in order to understand those events, we need a good theory. And the kind of theory that is based, you know, it, it would not make sense to have a theory based on bad neuroscience. Just that, you know, it, if it's based on bad neuroscience, that has to be a bad theory. Now, of course, since all theories evolve, Freud's theory has evolved into current neuroscience and no doubt current neuroscience in 20 years time will look different. So we have to be aware that that sort of thing happens. But the way I see it, the, the fundamental contribution of neuroscience to the present way we do psychoanalysis is very beautifully set out in, in Mark's 20 points with particular reference, I think, to the fact that it gives us some understanding why the transference is such a key thing and why working through the transference is the thing. You know, I think from Marx and Carl Friston's way of thinking uh, about all this, you, there's no way a few remarks to a patient are going to change anything, however well chosen, it, because what the patient has to do is work through somehow, and perhaps this is a key thing we should be discussing, how this, uh, what do you call it, re, um, reconsolidation can take place. Because I think this is, this clinically is the key idea in this entire presentation, what and how reconsolidation can really, really work. Thanks. Thank you, David, for this uh, so spontaneous uh, discussion and very deeply uh, uh, introducing the points Mark uh, already uh, started to put in discussion. And now, uh, Riccardo Bernardi. Uh, Riccardo Bernardi is a distinguished member and training analyst of the Uruguay Psychoanalytical Association, psychiatrist, researcher in the Uruguay National Agency for Research and Innovation, full member of the Uruguay National Academy of Medicine, professor emeritus of the, of, at the School of Medicine, visiting professor at the University of Ulm in Germany, at the University College of London, at Columbia University Center for Analytic Training and Research, former regional editor of the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, recipient of Mary Sigourney Award for major contribution to psychoanalysis, International Journal of Psychoanalysis Best Paper Award, Latin American Psychoanalytic Federation Award and Gold Medal Award of the Faculty of Medicine. Ricardo Bernardi is Vice Chair of the IPA Research Committee and Advisor of the Clinical Observation Committee, publications in several languages. Ricardo, please. No. Matthew. Ricardo, you've muted yourself, so I can't unmute your microphone. In the right hand side of your control panel, the microphone icon should be green. Okay, now we can. Can you hear me? Now? Everything okay? Sorry, I have a bad connection and I have some problems in this moment. But fortunately, I said that I was very 
happy and honored to discuss with Mark and with David, uh, to whom I very much appreciate and learn from them. Uh, Mark's papers, The Conscious Eat and the Neurobiological Underpinnings of Psychoanalytic Theory and, and um, um, Practical Theory, offers a valuable example of the kind of consilience that it is possible to achieve between psychoanalysis and neuroscience. It is interesting to recall how Solms, according to Turnbull, relates the way in which the idea of conscious id arose in him. In the midst of discussions, he said, on this topic at the IPA Congress in Berlin, he found in an unforeseen and unexpected way that the hypothesis of one discipline made it possible to better understand the problems of the other. Now, these are almost the same words with which we will describe what he called the consilience of inductions. This consilience gives force to a scientific hypothesis without implying methodological or epistemological confusion among them. Each of the disciplines involved will have to examine this hypothesis according to its own methodological criteria. I insist on this clarification as it is often fair that dialogue with other disciplines may undermine the specificity of psychoanalysis. Solms shows that, it, that the specificity of psychoanalysis does not mean the isolation and that the dialogue with neuroscience can be proof. Freudian metapsychology plays an essential role in both the psychoanalytic and the neurobiological thinking of souls, who says she's in very, a very hyphen in the word neuropsychoanalysis. I am a clinician and I am not, and I lack the necessary experience in neuroscience to judge many aspects of souls' proposal, but there are some points I'd like to refer to. I am sure Freud would have reviewed his metapsychological formulation if he deems it necessary in the light of new evidence. I also, I also think he would agree with the emphasis on the embodiment. That's a word that I would like to, to highlight, to underline, the embodied character of mental function. To describe the relationship of the ego with the ego, Freud used the metaphor of the horse, the id, and the rider, the ego. Sol's proposal emphasized the continuity that exists between the nature of both the horse and the rider. This should not be an inconvenience for Freud, who explicitly stated man is not a being different from animals or superior to them. Where to place the boundary between horse and rider? <clears throat> In my opinion, the, the idea, Marx's idea, is that the consciousness would arise on the border between what Damasio calls protocell, that is the first representation of the state of the organism, and the core cell, that is where we already find transient consciousness linked to the affects of pleasure and pleasure. This core cell can be also related to Pancep's affective consciousness as an emotional action apparatus of mammalian brain. brain. 
We thus find a second characteristic of this concession of the mind in addition to embodiment. It's an active nature. So I underline embodiment and an active nature. I would like now to refer to some points where it is difficult for me to understand and agree with some ideas of the conscious spirit. The first of these points has to do with the relationship between consciousness and the outside world. In Sol's text, the affect seems to come exclusively from the satisfaction of the need of the organism with the outside world limiting itself to providing the means to satisfy them. Objects are created in the virtual inner world from these experiences. However, the question arises, and that's a philosophical question in some way, arises at to what extent consciousness would be possible if there were no previous orientation of consciousness toward the world, but in the sense of Brentano intentionality or Heidegger being the world, in German, in their best sign. And in this sense, I feel closer to position such as Nordhoff when he calls for a neurophenomenal or neuro relational approach, which gives more hierarchy to the embedded or situated character of mental phenomena. I will try later to relate this embedded and, and, or relational phenomena with therapeutic, very concrete therapeutic question. Developmental research corroborates the constitutive role of the other as the source of affect. Mother-baby interactions modulate the rings between the, the two and influence some biological regulations of each of them. Care, play, and other infant needs imply for the beginning mutual interactive patterns that probably requires higher order neural structure and an extended perspective on mind. That means embodied, extended, embedded, and relational nature. It is a challenge for psychoanalysis, as well as for neuroscience, to advance the knowledge of the constitutive role of the other and of the relational and socio-cultural aspects of human life. Too often through history, human beings sacrifice hunger, fear, sex, and even life in pursuit of ideals, ambitions, or collective beliefs, sometimes, of, unfortunately, of, of the third nature. Now, the paper and the theory and practice highlights with admirably the current validity of psychoanalysis. Solms points out that outcome research confirms the efficacy of effect and effect of the effective the efficacy and effect effectiveness of psychoanalytic treatment. It also shows that psychoanalysis offers an adequate theoretical framework to understand the mechanism of action of psychotherapy. And in this, I agree very much with what David has just been saying. I would like to highlight some ideas. Sol points out the relationship between therapeutic change and the reconsolidation of repressed unconscious memory. The repressed memories preserve the prediction, as Marx said, or stereotyped action plans of the child in front of problems that overcame him. And we cannot access these memories only through declarative knowledge. 
but we know of their existence as they manifest as affects and <clears throat> enacted repetitive relational patterns. I think that at this point, Mark and David coincide, agree, and I also agree. When these memories are reactivated, they become fragile and stable and therefore potentially changeable or malleable. Pleitschmar, an um, Argentinian Spanish uh, psychoanalyst, have called moments of high receptiveness the situation during analysis, but not only during analysis, also independently of it, in which circumstances of diverse nature favor psychic change. The transferential interpretation that has been also underlined by Mark and David act in the context of a prolonged high frequency treatment and aims to take advantage of this window open to change. When scientific research answers some question, at the same time opens new questions. And I would like to add some examples. The windows of which high receptivity, in which the reconsolidation of memory and other changes also can occur. Does it happen only during, during the session or, or also outside it? That's a problem with the interrelation with other psychotherapies regarding the common factor. That shows to, to confirm that other ways of change are also possible, but also the life experience. Does the, trans, the interpretation within the transference, not of the, but within the transference, favor, can favor the patient to learn from life experience, transforming his neurotic repetitive pattern into a dialectical spiral that allows mental growth? That means how to balance the effect of transferential interpretation, but also from a relational and extended perspective, also the life experience that the work on transference during the session and as Marx says in his paper, also in the relation with the therapy from other orientation makes possible the patient to learn again from experience and from life circumstances. At a higher level of abstraction, it has been suggested that nonlinear models related, for example, to chaos theory that's the idea of Galatzer Levy, might be more suitable than the classical model for understanding the transfer, the transformation that occur in patients. That's an open question. Many other similar questions arise frequently in the IPA clinical discussion group when patient transformation during analysis are discussed. How to advance in the study of so many and so varied topics. I would like then to, to, to make a final remark. The need for clinical research is unavoidable. Storm shows, in addition, the usefulness of complementing it with interdisciplinary dialogue. This dialogue needs to be supported by a clear conceptual analysis and by the search in each discipline for the empirical evidence that sustains the hypothesis. And Mark's papers are an example of this. And I know also some David papers that are also in other fields an example of this. I would add that this is valid for the dialogue that psychoanalysis must maintain with scientific disciplines as well as with hermeneutics and humanities. At the same time, new theories and techniques have emerged and are emerging in the field of psychoanalysis. These theories are partly complementary, 
and part incompatible among them. Solm showed that Freudian metapsychology is the lingua franca among analysts from different, from different affiliations. At the same time, the new approach brings promising new challenges. Some decades ago, Blecher, an Argentinian and Uruguayan writer, say that while at an explicit level, analysts rely theoretically on the topical, dynamic, and economical point of view of classic Freudian metapsychology, at the level of implicit theory, their clinical practice was based on dramatic, situational, and dialectical points of view. These three perspectives can also be found in, other, in many other contemporary theories. They enhance, in my opinion, our clinical work and open new paths to dialogue with today's things. Regarding the dialogue with neuroscience, in my opinion, Blecher's viewpoints about the dramatic, relational, and dialectic characteristic of psychoanalytic work are consistent with the conception of the mind as embodied, embedded, extended, and enacted that I refer to above. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, thank you for this effort to contain Marx's ideas in the vast set of psychoanalytic uh, concepts. Uh, thank you both uh, with uh, David for this uh, effort to, that promotes changes. So I would like to ask uh, Mark if, uh, as uh, both Ricardo and David were centered on transference and on clinic, uh, if he could uh, give us his um, point of view, answering to David and Ricardo, please. Gladly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both uh, David and Ricardo. Um, my only problem uh, is that I find us to be in uh, almost total agreement on everything. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, the audience uh, will will be a little nastier to me, and so we can have um, a, a more controversial discussion. Um, I, I obviously can't take up all the points um, uh, that David and Ricardo made in their very rich presentations. I, I'll just pick up one or two uh, from each of them. Um, I think one of the major points that David made, and it's also picked up by Ricardo, uh, when Ricardo speaks of the specificity of the psychoanalytic method. Uh, and David uh, emphasized more than once in his presentation uh, the fact that we start from what happens in the consulting room, uh, that the psychoanalytic consulting room is the final court of appeal, as it were, for psychoanalytical uh, theory making. Uh, and I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I, I don't think that, that David would disagree if I say uh, we start with some theoretical notions before we observe anything in the consulting room, and then, of course, uh, we develop those theories not only from what we see, but from what we draw from other disciplines, just as Freud did, and then we take those ideas back to the consulting room, and this is the major point, uh, that it's only there that we can test their usefulness and their validity. Psychoanalysis is first and foremost a science of subjectivity. Uh, the data that we obtain uh, from the subjective experiences of our patients and between ourselves and our patients, that's the main thing. Um, and for that reason, uh, I would not have ventured forth um, with the um, points of view that I've expressed in these papers and, uh, and in this webinar. Uh, if I had not uh, preceded uh, the, these communications with long and careful um, uh, 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 checking of these ideas against my own clinical experience, but also against the clinical experiences of many co colleagues around the world. Um, I've had a study group here in Cape Town um, now for seven years where we've looked at ordinary clinical material uh, session after session after session in relation to these ideas and seen for ourselves, does it add something new? 
Is there something that we see that we wouldn't otherwise have seen? Uh, is, does it remove something we would otherwise have seen? Does it simplify too much? Um, and uh, if it does add new uh, insights, uh, does this make us say something different than we would have, do something different than we would have, and what is this? Uh, how does this affect the outcome? Uh, I say I've had that study group in Cape Town for seven years because that's the longest, but I also have a study group of, of long-standing in Tel Aviv. I have one in Lima, um, and I'm now starting one in Chicago and in Vienna, and I've also been on a sort of a um, I don't know what to call it, a roadshow running around the world, talking to colleagues about exactly these ideas. And in each uh, workshops I've given, which is now in a 20 cities, uh, they present cases. And we look at the cases in relation to these ideas. And um, it's really on that basis that I'm, that I'm even um, uh, daring to uh, speak to colleagues uh, about the clinical implications of these neuroscientific ideas. You must remember neuropsychoanalysis for about 30 years now, if you, if you date it from when I published my first paper in this area. And it's very late in the day that we finally say we have something to say to clinicians. Um, the, the other said, so I hope that, uh, I mean, as I say, I'm not disagreeing with David, I just want to emphasize how strongly I agree with him on that score. Um, and, and actually, sorry, if I may add a footnote, I say that also slightly defensively because I'm aware that many people um, who write uh, and speak under the banner of neuropsychoanalysis. Don't do that. There's a lot of armchair speculation of uh, sort of turning uh, uh, too rapidly neuroscientific ideas into psychoanalytical implications, technical implications. That, I think, belongs under the heading of wild analysis, just as it always did. Okay. Um, the second of David's points, uh, of his many points, which I'm, I just want to pick up on one of them, which is the relationship between affect and cognition. And he said much about that. Uh, it's all too complex for me to go into in any detail. I want to take just one tiny fraction of what he was saying. And that is the, the, the question of what distinguishes psychoanalytical therapy from other therapies, uh, and in particular from cognitive behavioral therapy, which I think is the, the sort of other main, um, the other main uh, show in town. Um, I, I think that the crucial distinction between our approach and theirs, and I don't mean to decry their approach. I think their approach has a place, it has a very big place, because not all problems are unconscious. In other words, not all of the bad predictions that we make as to how we can meet our emotional needs in the world, not all of them are non-declarative, not all of them are inaccessible to self-reflective thought. To the extent that you can just think through uh, what you're doing and come up with better solutions, great, do that. You know, who wants to have analysis if you don't want to? I remember when I was young and full of neurotic symptoms, I just wanted my symptoms gone. I didn't want the nine years, five times a week that I ended up having to have in order to get better. Um, so, you know, analysis is not for everyone. But when we're dealing with unconscious, that is to say non-declarative, automatized predictions, no amount of sensible discussion uh, and thinking about your problems uh, or thinking your way through your problems is going to work. Um, so again, I know David agrees with that, but that's the one aspect of, of the many things he said about the relationship of affect to cognition that I wanted to pick up on. Now, uh, turning to uh, Ricardo, and I'm, I'm being as brief as I can, uh, there's so much else I would like to say, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait for the longer discussion. Um, the question of intentionality and, um, and in Brentano's sense, and uh, the the role of, of of affect in 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 situatedness and in 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 uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in activism in in our relationship uh, to objects. I want to just emphasize this point, which is that we don't sufficiently. I mean, we of all people, psychoanalysts, uh, need to remind our our neuroscientific colleagues that most of our relationships to the outside world, that is to say, most of our cognitive representation of the outside world. Uh, and our enactment of predictions as to what we must do in order to meet our needs there. And incidentally, that's the whole point of cognition. It's, we don't learn for its own sake. We learn how to meet our needs in the world because we have to. Uh, the whole point of all of this is to automatize it, to do it unconsciously. You want to meet your needs immediately, easily, automatically. You don't want to have to be stuck with problems and think your way through them. The, the, it's the problems that prove to be insoluble 
uh, that, that is to say those that we do not have a go-to solution for that works, it's only then that we have to feel our way through those problems. That is to say it's only those object relationships which come to consciousness. Uh, so most of what we do in relation to our objects is unconscious. Um, the intentionality that I'm speaking about, which is something I think we need to add to Brentano, who of course was speaking only of consciousness, uh, we have to remember that the only reason that we direct uh, our, our mental states toward objects is because it's only in objects that we can meet our needs. Um, this is why life's difficult. We have to, we can't narcissistically gratify our needs. We need objects. We need to enter into the outside world. That's the only place where we can satisfy our needs. And to the extent that there's a problem there, to the extent that we do not know how to do it, to that extent we have, to have feelings. This is the whole purpose of consciousness, is so that we can feel how we're doing in states of uncertainty. Is this working or isn't this working? So um, I think that Brentano's a notion of intentionality and the whole inactivist and, and situated schools of biology, of which I'm a great admirer, I think they don't make enough of between what is conscious and what is unconscious. Lastly, in relation to Ricardo's many points, uh, the, the question of moments of receptivity. I think that it's very important uh, to first of all say in relation to that, the papers that I have circulated and the comments that I made, they are bare bones ideas. You know, we must never forget the rich complexity of our literature, which has developed over more than 100 years. You know, uh, I don't want to become another one of those theorists who thinks that his new ideas are the only ideas in town. They are little tips of an iceberg, or, or, you know, built upon a great deal that has come before. And uh, I think that much uh, of, of, of uh, what I have not said um, pertains to things which do not need uh, any additional neuroscientific perspectives. It doesn't mean that those things are not valid and important for what we do. So I, I want to emphasize that what I'm saying is to be added to what everything else that we do and everything else that we know. So now when it comes to this thing about moments of receptivity, my way of understanding it is twofold. Uh, the first is that this has to do with the defensive organization of the patient. We must remember that I'm drawing a sharp distinction between repression and the other defenses. I think that Freud made a mistake to follow his daughter's, uh, I mean, we all love our daughters, but that was a silly idea, to think that repression is just one amongst many defenses. I think that first we uh, repress uh, predictions which uh, we can come up with nothing better, it overwhelms us, we therefore automatize a solution which doesn't work. Because it doesn't work, we're left with feelings. In other words, the needs don't go away. They're, they're not regulated by those predictions. Then we institute defenses to protect us against those feelings. In other words, because we can't revise the underlying prediction, we have to come up with some kind of fudge, and that's what defenses are. Uh, and I think it's in the analysis of defenses that we find uh, a lack of receptivity or the opening up of receptivity. And it's also very important to note that defenses, unlike the repressed, are not necessarily non-declarative. Many patients can think about their defenses. You say, can you see you're doing this in order not to feel that? And the patient says, yes, I know, but I've got no choice. The important part is they know, but they, they feel they've got no choice. It's very different from what is it's absolutely unconscious forevermore. It can only, it's doomed to being enacted. It can never be rethought. Um, so, uh, one last point in relation to defences, uh, um, uh, uh, which is in response to um, Ricardo's uh, uh, question about it, uh, about these moments of receptivity, he said, can it happen only in the session? And I would like to use that as a springboard, that question, to make this more general point, which is that I think the same it doesn't only happen in the session, and I think the same applies to transference. I think we, we, we tend to sort of caricature or denude overly simplify our notion of transference, um, it doesn't only happen to the analyst and it doesn't only happen in the session. Transferences are the enactment with our current objects uh, of things which are transferred from the unconscious from the past, from our primary objects onto the, onto the present. And of course it doesn't only happen in our sessions, but in our sessions we have this wonderful opportunity to be able to think about it, to be able to have it drawn to our attention. And when the transference is focused on the analyst in the session, it's the best chance to make the patient, to enable, to facilitate the patient seeing what they're doing. Uh, so certainly I agree 
not only these uh, these uh, uh, moments of of reduced resistance, reduced defensiveness, and these moments of um, of insight into transference, they don't only happen in the session. Uh, uh, the, the session, however, is particularly conducive to these moments. I, I, I think, uh, uh, as a last point, I would like to say that a crucial thing about psychoanalysis, which again distinguishes it from other forms of psychotherapy, is that the, ther the major therapeutic action which is working through, that is to say, seeing again and again and again what you're doing so that you can consolidate a new way of, uh, of, of meeting your emotional needs in life, that that continues after the end of the treatment. Uh, the, this is why we have this best kept secret among uh, our, our colleagues don't seem to know it, that there's a thing called the sleeper effect. It's an incredibly important empirical finding that whereas cognitive behavioral therapy, which works with those things that it's suited to, the therapeutic gains slowly, uh, slowly they, uh, they, they sort of wither away after the treatment. That's why they have to have what they call top-ups. Whereas in psychoanalysis, the therapeutic gains are not only maintained, they actually continue to improve more after the end of the analysis. That's the sleeper effect. And I believe that's because working through carries on after the end of the analysis. Uh, in other words, the patient is able to make the interpretations to themselves, ideally when they're doing it. It's not you did it again, but oh, I'm doing it again. At that point, the patient doesn't need us anymore. But that, that is not the end of the therapeutic effect of, the, of, of transference uh, uh, understanding. This continues uh, for years after the end of the treatment. So thank you again. I think I might have spoken a little too long, but thank you again for those wonderful um, uh, discussions. Uh, sincerely, thank you both of you. And now let's see uh, what our colleagues uh, elsewhere have to say. I'm sure some of them are going to throw some more nasty at me. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. You have already started answering questions that I didn't an announce. So uh, I would like to to ask you, I would like to uh, put together two questions. The first one is, uh, could you please explain how you think the consolidation? But I would like to uh, associate it to another question. Uh, I would like to hear you about the link between declarative or non-declarative memory and language, referring to Freud's idea about repressed unconscious as language-linked materials? Um, sure. So um, the first question, which has to do with consolidation, it's sort of asking for some clarification of yes. the concept of consolidation. Um, I release my comments on that by uh, reminding us all that, uh, which both Ricardo and David uh, uh, acknowledge, that you know, Freud was working within a conceptual framework uh, which has uh, of, of of how the brain works and uh, and and how its cognitive functions work, which is really very old. And so there are many notions in our classical theory that I think we it, it behoves us to recognise that they're really old-fashioned ideas. So uh, memories are, and in fact, Freud had some foresight about this. Memories are not encoded. It's not an event the encoding of a memory. Memories are encoded over and over and over again. And um, it's not only in the sense that Freud spoke of where that multiple memory systems, that was where he had great foresight, but it's also a matter of that each time that you repeat, uh, enact, that is to say, a memory. Remember what I said, memories are predictions. The memories are not about the past, they're about the future. They're about what works so that I know what to do. Um, every time you repeat a, a memory, in other words, you reconfirm uh, that this works, to, it, 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 that makes the memory more and more deeply consolidated. And this carries on over years, um, from long-term declarative memory systems into long-term non-declarative memory systems. It's a slow process that carries on over years. And so this is the consolidation refers to. The whole process is called consolidation, but when the memory is in declarative long-term memory, it can be reconsolidated in what we call working memory, that is to say in consciousness. 
what is different between declarative and non-declarative memory is identical with Freud's distinction between the pre-conscious and the unconscious. L declarative long-term memories can be brought back into working memory. Uh, non-declarative long-term memories cannot. That means that they cannot ever be brought back into consciousness. So uh, in, in declarative long-term memory, uh, we have memories which are, as it were, provisional. Uh, this uh, this works some of the time, but I'm not yet sure. Uh, I, I better not automatize it. It's still subject to revision. Uh, that's what declarative memory is all about. Um, the consolidation uh, of those memories can, as it were, be undone by bringing the memory back to consciousness, and then it can be reconsolidated in an altered form. And this is crucial to Freud's concept of Nachträglichkeit, but again, it develops further, that concept. Um, so that's the main thing I want to say about consolidation. Uh, perhaps I should say one further thing, which is that one must not get the idea that it's always in series, that first it goes from working memory, then into declarative memory, and from declarative into non... It also happens in parallel. So some things go straight into non-declarative memory uh, alongside uh, the declarative ones. And so that's how we learn things that we don't even know we're learning. Um, I, for example, adopted my analyst's limp without knowing uh, that I was doing it. We never spoke about it, but one day my wife said to me, why are you limping? You know? And then I realized, my God, it's, you know, it's, uh, I've internalized this aspect of my analyst. And again, this is a gigantic thing, so I, 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 I won't uh, belabor the point. I can only make some, some uh, uh, initial uh, forays into that, into that topic. First of all, I want to draw uh, your attention to the fact that really we need to distinguish between two aspects of language, and of course language has more than two aspects, um, but I want to draw attention to two of them. One of them uh, is the role of language uh, in um, rendering, um, rendering um, thinkable, consciously thinkable, uh, certain uh, thoughts. There are... There are uh, uh, in the, in the, in the um, Freudian sense, um, memory traces, uh, declarative, that is pre-conscious memory traces, can be brought back to consciousness uh, in, the, in the manner that I spoke of earlier. And the reason they're brought back to consciousness is because they have to be. We, we don't want to be conscious of, our, of, of things that don't work, we, but we have to be if they don't work because consciousness is feeling, is feeling your way through the thing again. Now, thinking in words enables us to think about the relations between things. So we don't only have concrete reliving with movies in our head uh, of things that happened. We can think about things that happened. We can think about the relationships between things that happens. We can draw abstractions about those things. Uh, this is the great function of language. It makes it possible for us to consciously think about these uh, uh, higher order thoughts, uh, as uh, some uh, philosophers uh, uh, call them. Uh, this is one important function of language, and you can see obviously how important it is for psychoanalysis, and Freud emphasized that very much. But there's another aspect of language, um, which is that in the declarative memory systems, uh, we subdivide declarative memory into two types. The one is called episodic memory, which is memory for events, and the other is called semantic memory, which is memory for facts. And uh, semantic memory overlaps in interesting ways with what I've just said. That is to say, semantic memory is not concrete. It's not a matter of um, of, of reliving concrete experiences. It's a matter of, of drawing generalizations, abstractions, extracting the, the essence, the essential rules um, about multiple episodes. It's not efficient to think in episodes, on Monday I did this, on Tuesday I did this, on Wednesday I did this. What you want to say is, well, what's the general rule for God's sake? You know, that's a much better way of organizing uh, your, your predictions. Um, and this coincides with another aspect of what Freud called word presentations. It's not just a matter of rendering thoughts thinkable, it's also a matter of being able to abstract from the concrete. And why I'm drawing attention to this fact is because episodic memory, which is the other part of declarative memory, is the concrete thing presentations that Freud said uh, uh, predominate in the system unconscious. And I think here is another uh, one of those moments where we really need to rethink uh, uh, our old concepts. Thing presentations, concrete uh, reliving of, of experiences unmediated by thought, is part of declarative memory. 
um, what happens once those once those predictions are consolidated into non-declarative memory, and this is absolutely crucial, is that they are no longer in the form of images. They are not images because they're not cortical. They are not pictures. They are not pictures or words. You can't think them. You can't bring them into consciousness precisely because they're not images. They're not cortical mappings of, of, of what happens in our sensory receptor uh, organs. They become action programs. That is to say, motor responses. It's just A causes B. Boom, boom. There's no thinking in between. That coincides with what Freud called primary process. So why am I saying all of this? It's because I have a problem with the idea that the system unconscious, the dynamic unconscious, uh, the repressed unconscious functions like a language. I think it precisely does not function like a language. I think a lot of, I think the pre-conscious, as Freud said, uh, functions like a language. Uh, this was the, 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 that second uh, crucial feature of words, uh, which Freud said defined the mode of operation of the, of the system pre-conscious. But I'm saying the system pre-conscious, in fact, has two components. It has word presentations and thing presentations, and we're wanting to get them into words because things are, are, in, are an inexpedient way of thinking, too concrete. But once it goes into non-declarative memory, of which there are many, by the way, subsystems, what they all have in common is no words there, no language there, no, no grammar there. Uh, it's just action. Uh, and in this respect, they are like instincts. Uh, there's no, there's no imagery, there's no representation, there's no ideas. It's, uh, and uh, th this is why they're the ideal um, of uh, learning from experience. We want to get back to instincts, but we want instincts that work. That is to say, automatic go-to solutions where no thinking is required. Thinking is really hard. Uh, we don't like to do it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I'm going to be a bit uh, egoist uh, today and I will ask my own question. Uh, following what you are, you are just saying, I would like to ask you what about dreams? What about dreams and the functioning? Eliana, may I add something to what Mark had said? Go or on, please. Yes, go on. Please. Go on. Go on. Go on. Because I want to thank Mark because I learned a lot about a big topic that he can say with with real knowledge. You know? But I want just to mention one, again, a consilience example. Uh, when reconsolidation of memories appeared, I think, 20 years ago, no? Mark can confirm that with Sarah and other work papers. Bleichmann started a clinical research on these high receptive moments. And what does he find? He finds that these um, moments into which memories can change, into a clinical point of view even, and patterns of behavior, coincide with what Stern uh, was re researching in the clinical field as encounter moments, now moments, and uh, between analyst and patient. So what Mark saw, what Mark has so admirable show in one person mind, inside one person mind, happens in the session also in this encounter moment with the analyst. That's the relational aspect. It is, we can think on that certainly on the uh, classical metapsychological one person theory, but we also can look at it as a relational encounter moment or now moment in the session. And it's very important, very interesting that this high receptiveness increase when it was mirrored what happens in the patient and the analyst and mirrored in a complementary or coincidental way. Uh, that's the classical difference of counter-transference in, 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 in theory. Um, so 
we can see one mile or we can see two miles. And we find that combining both perspectives enriches the comprehension of change. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief uh, because I, I know that uh, Eliana wanted to uh, raise a point about dreams. I will just say this, that uh, even in the classical Freudian model, uh, Freud believed that the Oedipus complex is an inherited mental constellation. Even within that model, therefore, there's, a, there's, an, in, there's an inherent uh, notion of the other, uh, an inherited predisposition, uh, 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 pre predispositional notion of the other. Therefore, the idea that even Freud's psychology was a one-person psychology, I think, um, it, it's not entirely true. Certainly, the relational school and the intersubjectivists have extended that. And, in fact, prior to them, the Kleinians, the whole notion of, uh, of, of the importance of counter-transference in the extended sense of the word, uh, 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 the, 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 the Kleinian as opposed to the Freudian sense, was already uh, taking us in, in, in this uh, uh, two-person uh, direction. So all I want to add to that um, is that, uh, and again, I'm, I'm just picking one or two elements of what could be said from a neuropsychoanalytic point of view, um, is that interestingly, when I said earlier um, that we have more than two instinctual needs, um, there's been an enormous amount uh, of very important information coming from affective neuroscience about what the basic instinctual needs are of the mammalian and primate brain, uh, and, and of course that includes us. And there are many of them. I just want to mention some of them which are relevant to Ricardo's point. This, the, 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 the easy ones are there's a nurturant uh, or care instinct, the so-called maternal instinct, although of course it's not only restricted to women or mothers. Uh, then there's also what, what is called a, a panic grief system, an attachment system whereby uh, we need to attach to those who look after us. This is a separate instinct. These are two different brain circuits with different anatomies, different chemistries, and they are absolutely independent of sexuality, of the sexual instinct. I mean, this is an example of, uh, of instincts where there is an inherent other. Uh, that is to say, the baby that I look after uh, or, or the caregiver who looks after me. Um, even in some of the other instincts like fear uh, and rage and lust, there's an implication of another. Um, but the one I want to emphasize most is an instinctual need to play. It's a really a great surprise that mammals need to play. Uh, it's not we like to play, they need to play. If you, if you remove half an hour's playtime from a, 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 a juvenile mammal today, it will make up that half an hour tomorrow. It will play half an hour more. We need it. It's like a homeostatic need. And the, 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 we've learned a great deal about play, which is of great importance for psychoanalysis. But I want to emphasize the fact that through play, we come to know other minds. We have to take account of other minds. Um, otherwise, we can't continue to play. The crucial thing about play is in order to enjoy play, to continue to have the fun of play, you need to keep the playmates' involvement. And if you dominate too much, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you gratify your instinctual needs too much, the other, it's not fun anymore. The other one says, it's not fair, I'm not going to play anymore, you know, and then it's gone. So this, uh, this, inter, this intersubjectivity and relational uh, dimension to the instinctual life um, of the human being, I think that the study of play uh, is of central importance for understanding how this develops and also what can go wrong. A patient who can't play is in terrible trouble. Uh, and I would even go so far as to say that the analytic situation, I don't, don't mean this in a frivolous sense, the analytic situation is a play situation. It is set up like a play situation where there are, there are rules and there are boundaries. Uh, there's, uh, there's an as-ifness to it. And if it becomes concretely the actual lust or the actual rage, uh, then a, a play stops. And... Uh, where there's a hierarchy, a dominance hierarchy between the two of you, but you both have to take turns. There has to be something in it for, for, for both of you. So I think that in summary, uh, neuropsychoanalysis and, and affective neuroscience has a great deal to teach us about intersubjectivity um, and the relational uh, uh, in psychoanalysis. Interestingly enough, even from the point of view of instinct theory. So shall we turn to dreams? Dreams. Yes, it was about dreams and about regression. 
because I uh, there are some questions also about regression, how regression it can be understood in this way of uh, presenting and understanding the um, unconscious functioning. Because you are saying about images that they cannot become words. And I was thinking about the dream, which is uh, the, the functioning, starts from memories, ideas, words, and then goes to images and goes back to from images to words again when we uh, we talk about uh, a dream. So there are movements of regression and progression, and then again regression, and maybe even inside the dream, says Freud, there are three movements: it's progression, regression, progression. So I would like to hear you in that uh, point, please. Okay, well, you, know, you can probably imagine there's nothing that I like more than to be asked about dreams because uh, this is where my own scientific uh, work began. Uh, I started in the 1980s already studying brain mechanisms of dreaming and uh, I have continued, uh, it's <laughs> continued to be a central uh, part of my own research program. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity uh, to, uh, in, 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 in referring to, to this aspect of uh, neuropsychoanalysis. Uh, to, to make the point that notwithstanding what we all agree on, uh, the point I started out with when I responded to David's comments, we all agree that the clinical situation is the ultimate uh, court of appeal for psychoanalytical theory building. It has to be. Ob our observations are made there. We test our hypotheses there, at, 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 no matter where those hypotheses come from. Nevertheless, um, there are things that cannot be tested in the clinical situation, which can better be tested in experimental situations when it comes to um, the, the development of our theory. So I think it's a very interesting uh, case in point. Freud uh, listened with uh, free association and evenly suspended attention to the dreams and associations of his patients to those dreams and came to the startling conclusion that behind the manifest content, there's a latent meaning of the dream. Uh, and Karl Popper famously said that this is not science. In fact, many people don't know. Popper said, I believe Freud, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not, uh, uh, Freud's theory is not specific because it's not falsifiable. So Freud said he infers using the clinical method, he infers behind uh, the associations and the images of the dream that there's a latent meaning, a non declarative process going on. Uh, and this has the nature of a wish that there's a heartfelt a libidinal desire that drives the dream. And Popper famously said, well, you can't, you can't disprove that, you know, because Freud will always interpret uh, the manifest content to fit his theory. Therefore, it's of cardinal importance to note that using experimental methods, neuroscientific methods, we've been able to show that that's exactly what's going on. Uh, and, and so, in other words, using other methods, you're able to show that these claims are falsifiable. You can actually literally see in a pet image of the dreaming brain the things that you've just spoken about. Uh, in other words, you can see the regression. Uh, mm. The court process the prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, which is where verbally regulated cognition uh, goes on, uh, that these are deactivated uh, in dreaming sleep. Uh, it's, it's literally like Freud said, the ego goes to sleep. I mean, there you can see it in pictures. Seeing is believing, you know, and the cortical process regresses onto the perceptual systems. So the whole executive, what Freud would have called motor systems, the pre-conscious systems, these systems are deactivated in dreaming sleep and the posterior cortex, the, 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 the perceptual uh, systems are activated. There's not, this is not speculation. This is not a metapsychological inference. It was, but now it is absolutely demonstrably the case that this is what happens in the dreaming brain. So this is the value uh, of adding to our clinical methods uh, and in this instance, uh, it doesn't add anything to our psychoanalytical uh, insights because all it does is shows that they were right all along, all along, excuse the Freudian slip. But the, the other point I want to make is that what those images, uh, the pet imaging of the dreaming brain, and not only pet imaging, I used lesion analysis and, and single cell recordings and microdialysis and all kinds of methods and, and pharmacological probes and so on. What all of these methods show, but it's not the clinical method, what all of these methods show is that there is a massive activation of the instinctual need mechanisms of the brain during dreaming sleep. 
uh, if you look at the, the an, an image of the dreaming brain, you see two things. Number one, its executive control mechanisms are switched off. Number two, its instinctual emotional need mechanisms are switched on like a Christmas tree. Uh, and this is again, as I say, fundamental confirmation uh, of the of these mechanisms that that you're speaking about. That the linguistic um, Globally regulated executive cognition is switched off. There's a regression onto concrete perceptual, uh, in other words, from semantic type of uh, declarative memory to uh, to uh, episodic type uh, declarative memory. This is why we dream concrete movies in our heads. This, this is what they are. They're episodic memories. But behind all of that is a non-declarative process, in particular in relation to the emotional non-declarative systems because as I said, there are multiple non-declarative systems. One of them is the emotional ones. And these are what dominates uh, the mind uh, uh, during dreaming sleep. Now, I know there's a lot more that you've said, uh, uh, but I, and I'm not picking up on everything you asked, but I'm, I'm mindful um, uh, of the time. So those are the remarks. Yes. That I want to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Another question on the opposite. My question is about patients who present a concrete thinking not related to images nor representation patients who cannot play with their thought um their thought i'm convinced that only analysis can help them what do you think about it well um there, there's more than one such uh, type of patient uh, in, in other words although there, it's true that there is a group of patients who are exceedingly concrete, uh, it doesn't make them into one nosological category. Um, I mean, for example, there are patients who are concrete uh, uh, on the autism spectrum, there are patients who are concrete on the alexithymic psychosomatic spectrum, etc. I, I won't enumerate them all. So they are not the same thing. Uh, so it, uh, I, 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 that's the first point I want to make. Under that um, general notion, uh, let me mention um, two of the many factors that would go into uh, such uh, concreteness. One of them is the factor I've already alluded to, which is that play, which is an instinctual need, um, it, it, all of our instinctual needs, we're born with some rough and ready tools as to how to meet them, but they're not enough. Uh, so we have the basic impulse to rough and tumble play. We have basic uh, instinctual dispositions as to how to invite uh, a playmate to participate with us uh, and then there's a sort of a general notion of turn taking beyond that you've got to learn the whole bloody thing and it can go badly wrong which is why we have bullies uh, and it can go badly wrong which is why we have nerds uh, who get left out and who can't who can't find a place in the group and in the social hierarchy so when play goes wrong uh, one of the ways in which it goes wrong is you end up with a very concrete person because play is precisely, uh, as I said earlier, how we rise above the concreteness of our other instinctual needs and play with them in an as-if mode. That's the essence of what play is all about. And then we elaborate, in other words, symbolize. Uh, and this is how we, 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 one of the ways in which we get out of co the concreteness that in fact um, characterizes every child uh, at the start. Another way in which uh, you end up with concreteness uh, is from an entirely opposite direction, which has to do with defensive structures. And here again, I'm picking up on what David said earlier, or on some, some aspects of what David said earlier, and my comments in response to uh, what David said. It's, and in fact, also what Ricardo said, I'm just remembering. That is to say that we have to draw a distinction between the repressed and, our, and the defenses that we institute in order to deal with the inevitable consequences of the failure of repressed predictions to meet our needs. Those defenses take many different forms, um, ranging from neurotic defenses, the happiest of which is sublimation. Um, and the common factor of neurotic defenses is substitute formation through narcissistic defenses, where the, the, the common denominators of which are the ones David mentioned, projection and introjection. And I wanted to use this opportunity to make the point, these are defensive mechanisms. Uh, through to psychotic defenses, uh, which are characterized by, of course, the Seval. Um, psychotic defenses are exceedingly concrete. The patient literally experiences their thoughts as objects, 
coming at them, uh, you know, rather than seeing that this is my feeling, they see a policeman, you know, um, uh, persecuting them. Uh, in narcissistic defenses, there's also, a, a, it's, it's a relatively concrete uh, depositing of one's feelings into one's objects or expropriating uh, aspects of, of, of one's objects uh, in order to uh, shore up uh, one's narcissistic uh, deficiencies or narcissistic anxieties. Uh, these are concrete mechanisms. And uh, these cognitive mechanisms, they're not instinctual mechanisms, these cognitive mechanisms um, uh, can, uh, to the extent that they are of a narcissistic or even worse, of a psychotic nature, uh, these defensive mechanisms can produce uh, concretism in our patients. So I'm just using those two examples, that is to say the instinctual route to concretism, uh, and the defensive route to concretism in order to make the more general point that not all concrete patients are alike. Um, so I therefore can't say that every concrete patient needs analysis. Um, in fact, some concrete patients are utterly inaccessible to analysis. But I do agree that analysis is a great way um, of rising above the concrete. In fact, it's what it's all about. As I said, I think it's sort of, it's sort of modeled the play situation um, in a non-frivolous sense. Okay, um, there are many, many other questions, but uh, time goes by and we are approach at the end. So um, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark, uh, David and Ricardo for, for your so interesting and lively discussion, for sharing with us your priceless uh, experience of constructive uh, dialogue uh between you but uh, also between that uh, the dialogue that psychoanalysis can develop with other disciplines in order to preserve our future thank you all all the participants uh, for your active participation questions and attention and i would like to announce the next webinar that is in a month it is on may 26 and it will be on the psychoanalytical research in France. It's the uh, SPP's um, Paris Psychoanalytical Society Committee for Research and Development for, of Psychoanalysis. And our guests will be uh, Cesar Botella and Marie-France Dispo. It is on May 26, uh, save the day. Uh, we look forward for this, uh, to continue these scientific exchanges. Uh, with all of you, and we thank you very much for your attention, and until then, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark Solms, David Tuckett, and Ricardo Bernardi. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you, thank you very, very much. Thank Thanks. you very much. Bye. Am I able to say a word to David before we all disappear? We're not